to show you guys how to turn 24 inches of Dyneema into one of these. And this works great as a soft shackle for a hank on sale onto a Dyneema headstay. It's very small, but it's very, very strong. So your average bronze hank has a breaking strength of around 100 pounds, and this has a breaking strength close to 10,000 pounds. So it's, it's definitely stronger than needed. So I'm going to show you guys how to make this, and the best part is, this then works great on a synthetic stay, because it's Dyneema on Dyneema, so you don't have to worry about the bronze digging in and cutting the Dyneema up. And having a dog bone, it is incredibly secure, like it's not going anywhere. So the first thing you're going to need is 24 inches of SK78, so this here is uh, from New England Ropes, you can also use Amsteel Blue. They're all good. They're all the same thing. <laughs> so you can see here that the final product is a lot shorter, which means that all this is going to be spliced back into it and buried in this section here. Now, the way we do it, it also holds together. It won't just slip apart on you. So it's it's really really strong. It's a, quite a nice setup. So the goal here is to make a soft hank that is only two inches long inside. So as you can see, this is incredibly small. It's a tiny, tiny soft hank. Now if you want to make one of these larger, it'll be a whole lot easier to do. Like, so much easier. But if you want to make a tiny one that you can use to hold your sail, really closely to your stay, this is the process you have to do. Now let's look at the actual measurements. Your piece of Dyneema is 24 inches long. So that means that when it's doubled over, it's going to be one foot, so 12 inches. Now the final product is going to be a grand total of five and a half inches long. So as you can see, it's gonna get really, really small. So the actual working area is only five inches. The rest is all taken up here, over the splice, and then finally buried back into it. So let's look at what measurements you need to get from a 24 inch piece of Dyneema to a two inch soft shackle with a dog bone. Well, the first thing you need to know is out of your 24 inch piece of Dyneema here, four, the last four inches of the tail are just going to be buried back in for the splice and the rest just works out. So. From 24 inches, you can think of it as eight of those inches are buried back in in a splice. So we're just gonna take a look here. We're gonna measure out four inches of tail, and then we're gonna bury those tails right back into the line they came out of. So I don't use a marker because I don't like making little ink marks on my Dyneema. I just put a little tiny dimple that I can see so that way I know that my splice goes right there and right there. But if I don't want it or I want to change my mind about where I want to put something, there's no marks. So the most important part is when I'm all done, no one sees any ink marks. It's all nice and clean. So just want to push the fibers open and just work right through those 12 strands. Pass the tail through. Now I'm just going to make sure that the tail is four inches. We're good. Okay, and on to the other one. Now, when you put these on, you're actually going to put them on opposite. And then you're going to tighten them down really, really tight. Now at this point, you haven't done anything irreversible and it's very easy to make any corrections if needed. So 
with these little tails coming out in opposite directions. So you can see this one, the tail comes out on this side, and then the back one, the tail comes out on the opposite one, in the opposite direction. So we're just gonna put the soft shackle over it and we're just gonna check. It should be just a smidge over two inches at this point because nothing's been done in there. Now to measure, since it's pretty hard to figure out, all right, where, where are your points? I like to use the ends of the fids because they're cut at an angle. So when you put them in, they work like calipers. So we'll just center this so that way it's not interfering or anything. And we're at two inches and three eighths. So that is good. So when we're done with the splice and everything, it'll be shrunken down to about two inches. Why are these coming out on opposite sides? Well, it's very simple. And you're gonna see that right now. So normally, when you're doing a Mobius Brummel splice, also known as a locking splice, you would then take this and pass it through this one. So it locks, and then you bury this, and then you're good, everything's done. Now you can do that, but the problem is, in order to get the locking splice made, for both of them, you can't have the dog bone in here because the dog bone's gonna get in your way. So that means you have to make them off of the dog bone and then work them on. Now a dog bone starts off wide and gets narrower as it gets into the center of it. So if you start off on something that you can slip it into it, that means that it can also fall out. So you, it's not a really good idea there. So this way, they are super tight at the center. And as you can see with this one, it's not coming off, like it's, it's stuck. So the reason that these come out on opposite sides is for symmetry. Now, instead of tucking it back into each one and then you run the risk that these could pry apart, you're actually going to splice them into each other. This one's going to get tucked into this tail and this one is going to be tucked into this guy. So, this guy here is going to go over into this area. Now, you're not going to go from the top because then it's going to come out kind of wonky. You're actually going to come from the side. So we're just going to push that open right there, open the weave up. We're done with the tape measure. <laughs> so we're just going to open the weave up. We'll just slip that right through there. So as you can see, it's trying to pull it over. It's gonna actually induce a twist. Now, we just did this side. Now we're gonna roll it over, and we're gonna do the other side. Exactly the same. Everything is symmetrical in this. So we just open the weave, pass our fit through. So now you have a pretty nasty knot. Everything is tied into itself and into the other one. So they're pulling everything together. So we're actually gonna give that a nice strong tug here, just to, just to cinch everything down nice and strong. Okay, now we're going to flatten it. That way it's not big and balky. So we're just gonna torque on it until it lays flat because you actually want your soft shackle to be pretty flat. So, now you should have your soft shackle looking like this. You have the head, two arms, and then a big loopy body, okay? And you should see one of them going from here through the other one and then out for the arm and not see it on the other side. If you can see both of them, that means that they're crossing on top of each other and something's wrong there. So, on this side, you should see it come from here and then pop out to the side. When we flip it over, you should see the exact same thing. The left one pierces the right one and comes out the side. The left one pierces the right one and comes out the side. So that shows you that there is symmetry and that every time you look at it, it's always the same because they're mirror images of, of themselves. Now, 
what we're going to do is we're going to bury these tails back into themselves. So these are going to now bury into the respective arm that they are off of. So you're going to get really, really close to the base where the tail comes out. You're going to open the weave a little. Now an important thing to note, the middle was actually right here, but you can see that this side being all scrunched up seems to be much shorter than this very long side that is untouched. Now that is why when you first start and you measure everything, the total loop comes out to be about two and a half inches wide, but the final loop comes out to be two inches wide, and that's because when you get everything spliced up, it stays a little scrunched together. When you first finish, it's going to be a little more than an inch wide. It's going to be too small. So then you have to load it and pull it apart and stretch it to get it back to size. So that's going to take a little bit of work. Uh, you can do it with winches and just pull them apart. You can set up a pulley system. However you want to do it, you want to put load to them and actually pry it apart really hard and it will stretch and get to size. Now a little trick. You run the small fit through, and then you put the next size up into the back of it, and you push it through. And the hole's already made, the tunnel's already been opened up, so it's a little easier to get this one through. Now there's a reason that we're pushing through the fit that's too big for this, and that's because it actually makes life easier in a moment. So now, this guy easily fits into the back of the fid with the pusher. And the pusher is the important part, because the pusher actually doesn't fit inside the other fid with the line. So you put the whole thing in there, and you push it through until it comes out on the other side. One leg is done. For the other one, everything is symmetrical, so same thing. You're going to pull the leg back, and you're going to push the weave open just a little bit, and then as close as you can, you're going to feed the fid and open the weave. We get down near the bottom, and we're going to work our way out. So it's just going to poke its little head out of there, and just push it through. And I'll show you guys the difference. So working that big fit through wasn't very easy. Now we'll push the line into this fit and try and add the pusher and then try and push the whole thing through. Sometimes it does work, but sometimes it doesn't want to. Oh, actually, while we have the camera rolling, it's working. <laughs> okay, it doesn't always work. This is quite nice because this means I didn't have to push the other one through. But if you're having trouble getting it through or it keeps slipping off of the pusher and it's just not working, do the trick where you pass the other fit through as well. It'll make your life a lot easier. So, now we have this setup. So you have the head, and then little skirt, and teeny tiny little legs sticking out under it. No arms. Okay. You're just going to pull these back, get as much exposed as you can, and we're going to do the taper. So you can see here that if we just milk the line back into the cover, it'll go right in. But we don't want to do that yet because this end is very abrupt. It goes from 12 strands to 0 strands. So the problem is, this housing that's over it is going to go from being over 12 strands to being over no strands. And this junction right here is going to be a weak point. It's going to break. It probably won't break for the loads that this thing's going to be used for, but it's just good practice to always taper your splices when you're working with Denima. So, being how this is tiny, and I mean the taper is going to be super fast, 
we're going to do this a very easy way. So first we're just going to pull out pairs. So here's one. If I pull it out a little harder, I can reach the one below it. So here's a pair, and we're going to just slice those off. do another pair but in an opposite direction. We don't want to take from the exact same weave because then it'll start uh, unraveling on us. So we'll take these two now. So when you're t tapering 12 strand, you actually need to only cut off 11 strands. And by doing pairs, we've already cut four. So now we're going to take another four, another two from over here. So what you're doing when you taper is you're just making it a gradual decline from 12 to zero. So it's going to go 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, zero. Now, if you're doing a much longer splice and you actually have enough buried and then enough to taper, you're going to taper a lot more gradually. The minimum that you need when you're burying and doing a splice in Dyneema is actually 72 times the diameter of the line. Now, being how this is uh, in millimeters, by the way, so being how this is about five millimeters, we technically need the equivalent of 14 and a half inches buried. As you can see, that is not the case. So you're doing everything very small. Now, you do have to keep in mind the working load of a hank is less than 100 pounds. A bronze hank, its breaking load is around 100 pounds. So this is going to be plenty strong. So you don't really have to worry too much about the fact that you're not tapering it properly. Now, we've cut off six strands so far. We have five more to go. And this is where I do a little trick. I spread out the last six strands that we have. I set one aside. And I cut the other five off at an angle. And with that, we have an instant taper. <laughs> So it's a, it's a heck of a lot easier, a lot quicker. The only reason I don't do it before, like all the way back here and just chop off the whole thing, is it's a little too rushed. It, it's, it's too much of a step. So that's why I, I thin it down. I get it down so that the last five I just slice off. But the first six, I cut them off properly. So I'm just going to do the same thing here. Now a trick when you're cutting Dyneema, I've seen for sale those fancy ceramic knives and they advertise them as Dyneema cutting and all these things. You can save your money and use any regular knife. It helps for the knife to be sharp, there's no doubt about that, so you want a sharp knife, but any knife will work. What you need to do is you take the Dyneema and you fold it back on the knife because Dyneema does not like sharp bends. So when you bend Dyneema really sharply, what happens is the fibers actually get brittle and break. So you might think you're cutting Dyneema, but in reality, you're breaking Dyneema. And you're breaking it over the edge of the knife. So that's why it doesn't have to be super sharp because all you're doing is breaking it. Now, this diagonal cut business that I do, that you need a sharp knife for. If you have a dull knife, you're gonna be there forever. But if you ever need to cut Dyneema, the easiest way to cut it is not on a board and sawing into it. It's just fold it over the knife and slice. You just fold it over the knife. And it slices right through. Now we're down to our last little bundle. So I'm just going to spread out the fibers. I'm going to pick the lucky one, which is going to be this guy. And then the rest we're going to cut off diagonally. So 
So with that, the tails are tapered and we're just gonna milk them back into the casing. You see they just disappear right away. Magic. Now you're just gonna work it until it lays flat. You want your toggle, you want the dog bone to be flat in here so that when it sits, it lays flat. If there's any tendency for it to turn like that, the problem you're gonna have is that when you load it, it's going to twist and you run the risk of it actually coming off. So, you always wanna make sure that when you're done, it's laying flat. So you wanna work on it, torque it, kinda of get it there. And then it'll lay flat, and then when you load it, it'll pull evenly. And then we have our little tiny soft shackle, which when we measure it, is just shy of two inches inside, the internal diameter. When this guy gets fully loaded and stressed, it'll stretch just that last little bit, and then it'll be two inches of internal diameter, which is the same size as a bronze hank, which means that this can be a direct replacement because this thin little section, you can actually slip it through the grommet of the sail where your, where your bronze hank is, comes out on the other side, you wrap this around the stay, and you hook it on. And now your sail is attached to your stay with a soft tank. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends. And if you'd like to follow our journey in real time on a map, receive postcards from our ports of call, and messages directly to the boat, you can go ahead and become a patron using the link in the description down below.